so what I would like to talk today is a bit pow about powder-based methodology manufacturing. Can I will tell you why a bit about powder-based? And I would like to start about possibilities and talk a little bit about challenges, what we see from point of view. Uh, so if you look on the metal powder-based additive manufacturing, there are four uh, main methods, actually the most industrialized and core, I would say, most in percent of the market. It's laser powder bed fusion, electron beam powder bed fusion using laser or electron beam as energy source is also binder jetting and direct energy position. And I think in Gothenburg we have a strong legacy when it comes to these technologies. As you know, Arkham is in some ways spin off from Chalmers, uh, binder jetting, uh, digital metal also uh, did uh, coming from Gothenburg, and this is also where we did a lot of work on the sintering um, technology, laser powder bed fusion. As you know, it's also very has very strong connection to the electrolux in the in the past, and uh, direct energy deposition. That is something that also has a very strong basement in Trollhättan and close to Gothenburg as well. Uh, so we have a very strong, uh, I would say, industrial base around these technologies. But also, what is very important to remember is that actually all of these technologies rely on the metal powder as a base material. And when it comes to this material, Sweden is leading country in manufacturing. If you look on the growth of these technologies, of course, directly connects to the need in the development and application of these materials. And as you see, it's multiplies more than 10 times uh, from 2018, where these activities were strongly started in Chalmers, so even a year before until actually. So if you look on 2017, when we started the center, you could see that it was a uh, very low amount of materials available for the meaning it was significantly limiting the number of the applications. And developing of materials for AEM is pretty time consuming and also dedicated process because of specific of technology, of solidification uh, and so on. If you look on the current state of the art, the number of materials is multiplied two, three times. Uh, and this is where, as, as you can realize, maturity of technology in these years came to the level where hardware is in place, but what is really required is development of material. And there are still some gaps there, structural steel, high strength aluminum, high performance nickel plates, super alloy, and so on. And still, I would say, sooty materials is far back from what we have actually in conventional metallurgy. But what's also very important to remember here, it's not just designing material for him, it's also designing materials and powder for him. Because when you design material, you have to design it for this uh, solidification, but also you have to design it in a way you can manufacture and maintain that powder in the forms that can be used for this application. Uh, so this is what is important to remember when you talk about design of materials for additive manufacturing, you design of the powder material. And this is uh, more or less connected how this technology works because in other team manufacturing, we have this clear idea. This is why we call it very often CD printing. You have a cut file, you push a button, and the edge is coming component. Um, but unfortunately, the process is much more complex than it. It's, it's multi scale process where, first of all, you have to deposit the powder, you have to pack it properly, you have to pack it in a way uh, that it represents and it's also consistent over the build. And uh, what's important to remember is that one kilogram of powder is around two billion of powder particles when it comes to the fusion, meaning there you can have core different statistical deviation. After powder part, after powder bed is packed, you have uh, energy source, laser, electron beam, or glue in other case, and uh, interacting with this powder bed, meaning you have a solidification or melting and solidification on a micro scale. But then after you create this small micro melt pool, you start to, you have to, to cover the whole area and therefore you have a strong interaction. How does this melting pool will overlap uh, to create the fully dense material with the necessary properties. Meaning by playing between uh, these parameters, meaning powder bed itself, as well as energy source, energy source parameters, but also the way you scan uh, the area will determine how your microstructure look how your stresses are distributed and how it's effect corrosive uh, defects. So in there we have a lot of different types of defects really depending on, on these two parameters. But then what's important to remember at the end, we have a final material. And whenever we go to the final material, we have to apply some post EM heat treatment to get to the material properties we require. And that could be heat treatment, that could be whole tissue 
pressing to, to avoid and minimize the effect as well as surface treatment machines and so on. And this is a thing where the CAM is the biggest challenge when it comes to additive manufacturing because uh, we claim we can have more or less uh, full geometrical flexibility, but whenever we apply geometrical flexibility, and this is something I will uh, emphasize more today, and uh, we start to deal with the difference in material properties. And uh, when we, uh, for example, an often give a lectures to a materials designer, um, materials designer very often learn to design a component, but in case of other manufacturing, design affects material properties a lot. It means that actually design of the component also means designing of the material, meaning you have to take the changes in material properties into account during uh, the, the design phase as well. And material properties here is actually a combination of both material as well as process itself. So, and this is comes back to the material design of what we're discussing, because material design here is not just designing alloy composition for the rapid certification, but really designing material for the whole manufacturing, starting from the powder manufacture, a young process, as well as post young process. In many cases, post-TM is a must. In number of cases, post-TM is cannot be used because of the cost requirements and so on. And this is something you really have to take into account in the material development of the initial phase. If you look on the seven main categories of, of AM technologies in general, uh, covering mostly 200 technologies, what you can find that the minimum half of them are strongly relied on the metal. I mentioned before, if you look on the metal additive manufacturing, uh, AM technologies uh, cover more than 90% of the market. But even if you look on the powder based technologies, they utilize pretty different powder means, this different powder size fraction, and that is, of course, in some way a very different material. So, after material is designed, you have to manufacture it. And there is a lot of different ways to do it, different type of gas optimization methods, uh, different productivity. And you can go from the, I would say, very nice methods to produce very spherical and pure powder, like plasma optimization or AGA method, going to the more cheap gas optimization methods. And all of them include gas as atomizing media, all of them use this melt, but the way it's done, it's affect really productivity, going from one kilogram per minute to more or less 100 kilogram per minute, or in case of water optimization, even higher. And in that way, it's of course, strongly affects properties. Um, and if you look on this effect, what you can see here, we cannot discuss, of course, cost that's not really important, but if you look on the same materials, for example, here, a stainless steel that can be produced in water optimized, gas optimized, or ego, ego state, you can see there is a huge difference. And as you know, if you go to gastronomy, if you compare prices approximately, it has to compare potatoes and caviar. The same material simply made in different way will have very different price, but of course it will also affect the properties. Properties when it comes to the powder morphology as well as the powder thickness. And what's important to, to, to really understand whenever material development is done for additive manufacturing, what are the requirements for the powder for the final properties? And is that way go back and figure out which type of alloys, but also which type of the material manufacturing and therefore uh, AM technology can be selected to, uh, to, to use this material. So as I mentioned, first of all, after powder is manufactured, it has to be packed. I Meaning it has to be homogeneously distributed over the powder bed uh, in a way that you have a homogeneous and the same powder bed along the manufacturing, um, meaning very well packed. And after powder is packed, you have to start making a component by melting the, the powder. So therefore here we have a strong interaction between the powder, powder manufacturing, as well as its interaction with energy sources as you can see here. Um, so sand by scanning uh, the powder bed is, is in this case laser, uh, what you can see, you melt the powder and here you really determine what is the powder bed density and to which depths, to which uh, beads you will actually uh, melt your material and how uh, that will affect the properties of component of the So here you can see these two powders I showed before, water and gas atomized material. If you look on the most distinctive features, that is oxygen content, is about 10 times larger. 
but as I showed you about the distribution before, by playing with the polymorphologies, we can still manage to distribute it and we can still manage to melt. So if you compare, for example, uh, these two materials, you know, is a powder diffusion, both gas and water atomized powder can be melt more or less to the full density, meaning from both potato and caviar, you can actually get uh, but when you start to play with the process parameters a bit more, trying to boost, boost productivity, because still you have a strong effect with the morphology, you have strong effect with the, of the powder packing. You can see that this material, what has the most powder, becomes more sensitive uh, to, the, to the coast. At the same time, if you look on the properties, you don't really lose uh, so much. So you can see properties of the water and gas. Close and at the same time, they are still in, um, in in the same level or even above the problem. So the same thing is still specified for the gas. Um, so as I showed you, one of the biggest impact of the optimization method is of course oxygen. Content. And of course, uh, oxygen in the powder is typically a bit higher than in the bulk materials we use to because they have surfaces, surfaces are oxidized. And then in the process, it becomes strongly affected. And here you can see the effect of the EM process on the oxygen content between the powder and, and the material. And what you can see in case of uh, stainless steel and nickel based alloys, because of the lower stability of oxide, we can actually go with the oxygen level pretty far below the standard ones. In case of more sensitive materials like titanium and aluminum, that becomes significantly uh, more difficult. But when we look on the state of the art in general, I mean, we, we know at the moment that for the materials developed for the powder manufacturing and powder, powder specifications in place, density is not a problem anymore. We can reach a fully dense material in pretty short development time. Uh, that is simply characterized with uh, 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 typical texture characteristic for the RDT manufacturing, meaning that if everything is placed, we can guarantee for the AM materials that we have a similar or better this is a rot material. As you can see here, for stainless steels, we are pretty on top of the specification. Yield strength is much higher. The innovations in place as well. Means that it would be really unfair to say that AM materials have unfair properties for in comparison to the traditional materials, as we know when it comes to the static properties. But uh, this is situation is not as easy as I mentioned. Powder bed is parked, powder is manufactured, but then we have another part that is much more complex, it is really a melting of the material. And here we have uh, also uh, uh, a lot of interlap between the, uh, the melt pools. So we create a melt pool and we scan the melt pool, we melt material, and depending how these melt pools and melt scans are interacting, how they are rotating, that will affect the gradient, and that will, of course, microstructure. And what does this mean that if you look on the same material by simply playing with these parameters, by simply playing with the laser scanning and therefore thermal gradients, we can affect microstructure significantly. Means that we can go from the isotropic microstructure or almost isotropic microstructure with the uh, random rotation of 67 degrees very high the maximum um, disturbance and therefore we have as a most as a tropic microstructure we can go to more or less a columnar structure as you can see here he plays in this type of a fiber composite and that of course will affect properties uh, uh, of the material but there's also another part um, as I mentioned here um, whenever we create material we do a lot of complementary means that we have a pretty complex thermal gradients to the materials that of course as you can see here as a current state of the art we have no problems to produce a very same design features with the thickness up to 200 micron covering to the laser scans that are fully gas dense issue we have there because of the inherent uh, feature of the technology when it comes to certification microstructure will be very different and this difference in microstructure will also result in different mechanical properties and this is something that of course is important to take into account when design these features but also now whenever we build a complex component these design features they are never oriented horizontally they have some kind of inclination and when we change the angle to the build we change the nucleation growth because in this case uh, we start nucleation from the base powder and we continue growth 
gradient means that we also have another part in scope. Uh, so that's what I mentioned from the before. Whenever you design component for audit, you also design it, you design it microstructure. And therefore, this is something always to remember when component is designed, but also when component is designed to manufacture in the, in the build chamber. Uh, but manufacturing doesn't finish here. So now we have a material, and I show you AM produced materials have this very nice uh, strength, very high yield because of the fine cell structures. At the same time, issues we have very high residual stresses resulting in distortion and annealing with an ideal for course of tolerance. So, what we typically have to do, we have to do is stress with annealing. And whenever we apply that, depending on the process we do that, we will affect microstructure again. We need to deal with anneal this microstructure. And in that case, what you can see here, we will strongly affect specifically uh, yield strength. And this will be strength to have a so, as I mentioned before, whenever material is designed, we really need to know what are the fine requirements in order to select not just process, but also process and process to get uh, So, what, what I mentioned a lot today was really how does AM affect, for example, texture and mechanical properties, but also AM allows to really produce a unique microstructure. And I will show you a very simple example on the carbon botanic steels. And uh, because what is very often applied in additive manufacturing is uh, trying to take a synergies from the welding and take the same approach for the material design as is done in welding. And in welding, we know that, for example, non weldable alloys uh, are limited when it comes to the carbon content, and claim is that you cannot really produce weld material with most no points refers to carbon. And uh, so, what is done here, we develop a number of low steels with a much higher carbon. Content we manufacture iron carbon system up to 0.7% carbon, producing a fully dense material. But still, these materials are non weldable. And how we actually do it? Because what you can do is in, in case of AM process, you really pre produce in microstructure, you also produce, uh, mono, you also use something we call in situ heat treatment. What you can see here, it's a simple marking site, it's a simple iron carbon system. And what you can see on the top layer, you see it's much whiter, so it's a sequential marking site. And what happened after the melt pool, you can see that marking site is softening pretty much. Why marking site is softening? Because you have this initial uh, heat input that is pretty fast, it's pretty high, and this realizes, uh, this, uh, realizes in the marking site during uh, all of the manufacturing. So if you look, for example, on this top layer, you can see you can see a typical microstructure for the French uh, Martin site, no carbides and carbon is homogeneous distribute. You can see uh, a little bit of an oxygen and, and the boundary. But if you look on the layer just below 100 micron below the surface, what you can see is that in these milliseconds, this Martin site would actually anneal. If you look on the conventional template of Martin's, I typically do it for hour or two. Here, we actually, in microseconds, you come to the effect of the same uh, precipitation of the nanocarbons that you see in much longer times in produced materials. Martin's structure here is also pretty unique. It's much more finer because of this. So, um, Another part is, of course, uh, or issue or challenge we have in additive manufacturing is, of course, uh, manufacturing time. So, if you look, for example, in this video, you can see a real time uh, AM process. So, what you can see is that if you want to build one millimeter of material in, in, in typical uh, iron or nickel based materials, this 20 micron layer, we have to build around 500 layers, means that it's, of course, will require time. And in order to make this technology, uh, Function, they, of course, there is a big challenge to make sure that this can be done faster. And the easiest way to do it faster is, of course, to increase the layer thickness. So going from 500 layers, going to 200 layers, going to 150 layers without compromising the properties. And this is the example that was done together with Alpha Laval and another corporate, uh, hopefully after, uh, after this talk. Uh, but what I want to emphasize here is, is really material part of the issue. So what you can see here, you can really build a component with a different height. Yeah? So 
means that going from the 460 hours, it is extremely long, making these components really inefficient. You can go down to more as 100 hours if you boost the process. But what's important to remember here, because as we boost the process, we change the energy input, we change the powder packing. Even so, we get a fully dense material, we have a pretty different microstructure. And what you can see is this also will affect a mechanical property, small as going from 460 neo strength to the 540, so around 20% difference. And that's, of course, something that is not an issue if you properly take it into the design and you. Um, so as process is pretty fast and pretty complex and multi-layer, what is really important is to make sure that you have proper quality. That can be done in different ways. We can do it in situ using the gas. We can also do it in situ using the thermal radiations. I see I'm maybe trying to the time, but I just want to show this component again. And what this component shows that you can see what you can see directly, how do they affect the heat input? See, the areas where we build fast, we put much more energy, they are in red. This is really also where we introduce much higher radiance in comparison to the areas that are in blue, where energy is much lower, means the microstructure is also much finer. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is another very big issue we, can, we encounter in additive manufacturing. It's gas. From one side, we have to use the gas to minimize the sputtering. So, if you look, for example, compare argon and helium in this case, you see that helium produces much less sputtering, much less bright. If it produces much less sputtering, what does this mean? We can actually boost the process as well. So, here, just by changing the gas, we can also change the manufacturing. What's important to remember is this gas will also have some kind of effect on microstructure, especially when it comes to the fine design features. And that is something that Helena will show later on. And uh, what is really important is to have this nice in situ characterization techniques. So this is one of the works that we've done together with PSI, where we look not just at microstructure formation, but what I want to emphasize here is also this pattern. And if you look on the next image, and if you look, for example, on, uh, on the C sequence of the uh, formation, you can see agglomerate. And then this agglomerate in this millisecond, it gets melted again to be as ferroidized, and then it gets melted once again when it enters the solution. So, meaning in one second, we have so many processes taking place and changing the behavior of the material. Uh, so, just to summarize, uh, when it comes to other team manufacturing materials are very important and powder for EM is now considered as one of the main drawbacks to the broader industrial application. Um, and honestly, until now we use AM only to process and lose the material. But what we see, AM also has a huge potential that is starting to be implemented more and more into the in situ synthesis of new materials, in situ synthesis of new microstructures multi-materials and composites. And when I talk about composites here, it's not just the composites uh, in, in methods, you can also add uh, other particles. Quality assurance, machine learning, and big data in connection to this is also more and more start to be implemented here in data manufacturing and, and so on. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I would also ask to, would like to ask uh, to thank uh, all of the uh, support from Lighter Channel.